Most medieval rulers hungered for glory on the battlefield, but what if a king was unable to achieve victory in an honorable way? Would he sacrifice chivalry and fair play to trick the enemy? Of course he would. From donning a disguise to broken promises and fake maneuvers, let's travel back in time now and look at some of the deceptive ways in which victory could be won. The medieval world is one that fascinates us, whether that's the grim, I can't look away from the horror kind of fascination or a deep curiosity about what society would have been like. We reimagine the world over and over again, and especially when we're playing games. Tabletop role-playing games are often set in a medieval adjacent world, albeit one with a few more elves and dragons than we can confirm existed in 10th century England. So what if I were to tell you that there's a tool out there that will help you develop your very own world? If world building and storytelling intrigues you, then you absolutely must check out World Anvil. It's the ultimate all-in-one software for anyone even vaguely interested in tabletop RPGs or world building. World Anvil has a suite of amazing tools for game masters to create interactive maps, track timelines and backstories, and even combine the two to build a record of your entire campaign. World Anvil is also perfect for the writers in our midst. If you've ever tried Na No Re Mo, you'll know that preparation is key, and World Anvil helps take the difficulty out of that. It has features like mind mapping, plots, templates, and family trees to help you keep everything straight, as well as drag and drop scenes and chapters to make editing even easier. It also has the ability for you to be able to publish and monetize your work through Word Anvil, meaning that you can build your fan base and quit the day job. It's the perfect tool for creating a rich, engaging world, and if you want that to be medieval themed, we absolutely approve and would love to see what you create. To help you get started, you can use our code MEDIEVAL to get 51% off any premium annual subscription, or by going to the link in the description below. And now for today's video. Welcome to Medieval Madness. He who fights and runs away. William, Duke of Normandy, is most famous for having a little fallout with the Anglo Saxon English king Harold Godwinson. Following the death of Edward the Confessor in 1066, Harold claimed the crown, however, William argued that the throne of England was promised to him, and this culminated in the Battle of Hastings and the Norman invasion. But it was not the first time that William had disagreed with a fellow ruler. It had taken 20 years for him to finally defeat his rivals and consolidate the Kingdom of Normandy with the help of King Henry I of France. But then the king allied himself with Joffrey, Count of Anjou in 1052, and threatened Normandy's southern border. Much to his annoyance, William's uncle, the Count of Arc, joined in the alliance too. On hearing of his uncle's betrayal, William was quick to lay siege to his castle at arc just near to Dieppe. King Henry went forward with an army to help relive the Count, but William's forces decided to set a trap. Most of the Norman knights hid, whilst a much smaller group went out into the open, and when they were seen by the French, they pretended to run away. The French soldiers fell for the trick and ran straight into the ambush. The successful ploy was described in a Norman chronicle, quote, and suddenly, when they had turned back, those who had been seen to flee began to strike fiercely at them to such a degree that, in that fight, Ingurand, Count of Abville, was killed, run through together with many men, and Hugh, known as Bardolf, was captured with many others. At the Battle of Hastings 14 years later, William used the same strategy when he lured the English away from their defensive position on Senlark Hill. It's hard to know if this was a real retreat because of a rumor that William had been killed or whether it was a genuine ploy to deceive. Either way, William and his army won and the Norman conquest of England had begun. Lives to play dead. One particularly audacious trick used to outwit the enemy was pulled off by a medieval crusader in the 12th century. In 1098, during the First Crusade, the Italian prince Bohemond of Taranto led the Christian forces to victory, and they were able to capture the city of Antioch, now the modern-day city of Antakya, Turkey, on the way to Jerusalem. Bohemond, who was described as a marvel for the eyes to behold, with a reputation that was terrifying, declared himself the Prince of Antioch and settled into his new life there. However, within six years, Antioch and its self-styled prince were in trouble. The Muslim forces were pushing back, and then there was the great threat coming from the Greek Byzantine Emperor Alexios Komnenos, who believed that Antioch was rightfully his. So Bohemond returned to Europe in 1104 to gather reinforcements. 
According to the writings of Anna Komnene, who was not only the daughter of Emperor Alexios, but also a historian, Bohemond spread rumours about his death to avoid being captured by the Greeks. He even had his men carry him on board the ship inside a special coffin with hidden air holes. And he kept a dead cockerel at his side to produce the smell of a decomposing body. Whenever the crew and soldiers came near land, they would wail and cry loudly as though they were mourning their commander. At other times, when he could not be seen by other ships, Bohemond would get out of the coffin to eat, drink, and walk around. The deception was successful, and Bohemond was able to evade the Greek soldiers. For his bravery and cunning, Princess Anna described the trick as not very dignified, but amazingly crafty. The art of subterfuge seems to have run in the family. Robert Guiscard, Bohemond's father, was said to have captured a town in Calabria, southern Italy, by pretending that one of his men had died, and he was bringing the body to be buried at the local monastery. The same scheme was used by Bohemond's brother to seize Monte Cassino near Rome. A dead body was also said to have been used to fool the enemy at the Battle of Valencia. El Cid was a Spanish nobleman who became a legendary warrior during the 11th century. He fought against both Muslim and Christian armies. Legend has it that when Valencia came under siege by the Moorish Almoravid army, the body of El Cid was fitted with his armor and strapped to his horse to boost the morale of his troops. It was a dead El Cid and his knights who were said to have charged against the enemy. On seeing the great man thundering towards them, they broke ranks and ran away, allowing the Spaniards to cut them down and win the battle. Dressed to Kill Individuals and groups have used symbols to represent themselves for thousands of years, but it was during the Middle Ages that the use of specific colours and emblems came into their own. Coats of arms were used on the shields and other equipment belonging to nobles to differentiate a member of one family from another at home in tournaments and also on the battlefield. This was risky though, because it meant that a person could be singled out for capture and ransom or even execution after the fighting had ended. Some leaders dressed their bodyguards up in their crests to avert attention away from themselves. In 1403, at the Battle of Shrewsbury, King Henry IV of England had two of these body doubles who were both killed by Archibald, Earl of Douglas. In Shakespeare's play, Henry IV Part I, Douglas learned of the deception and vowed, quote, Now by my sword I will kill all his coats. I'll murder all his wardrobe piece by piece until I meet the king. Going into battle without a crest was always an option, although it was much riskier. It made the individual nameless and could cause them to be killed rather than held for ransom. In 1415, at the Battle of Agincourt, the Duke of Brabant, a French knight, did just that and fought wearing another man's armour and coat. In the aftermath of the battle, Brabant's secretary recorded that the Duke's body was found some distance from the fighting. Someone had removed his helmet, and he was wounded in the head and neck. His secretary believed that the English did not know who he was because he did not wear his coat of arms. If he had, Brabant might have been kept alive as a valuable prisoner. Ranulf II, Earl of Chester, allied himself with Empress Matilda against King Stephen during the 12th century English Civil War known as the Anarchy. Ranulf used deception to capture Lincoln Castle after losing his lordship in the north. Along with his half-brother William of Rumere, first the men sent their wives to visit the wife of the constable there. The woman arrived escorted by three men dressed as ordinary knights. Once inside, Ranulf seized the castle weapons, admitted his own men, and threw out the royal garrison. King Louis IV of France, known as Louis the Fat, and his men went one step further and disguised themselves as monks to attack a Norman town. The Kingdom of France was a collection of feudal principalities when Louis inherited the throne. So, Louis spent most of his reign fighting the robber barons or the English kings for their possessions of Normandy. When attacking one town on the border between France and the Duchy of Normandy, Louis and his men entered disguised as monks in hooded black cloaks. Once inside the walls, they threw off their robes and took the town. This disguise was seen as ingenious by the French and blasphemous by the Normans. It all depended which side you were on. Asleep on the Job when Philippe IV of France invaded Flanders in January 1300, he was quick to imprison her ruler, Count Guy of Dampierre. By the spring, rioting began in the city of Bruges because of the cruel behaviour of the royal governor, James of Châtillon, so he entered Bruges in May with an army to quell the rioters. Unbeknownst to the French, the supporters of Count Guy sneaked into the city in the early hours of the morning and slaughtered the Frenchmen in their beds. Going from house to house, they killed hundreds and Châtillon had to flee. From the French perspective, the Flemings were treacherous. 
From the Flemish viewpoint, the French had asked for it because they had entered a poorly fortified town with little caution or prudence with so many of their deadly enemies at hand, and should have expected reprisals even while they slept. Promises, promises. Pledges were taken very seriously during the Middle Ages, especially if they were made before a Bible or holy relic. After all, keeping your word was the honourable thing to do, and the medievals were all about the chivalry. It didn't stop some unprincipled leaders from breaking their oath to give themselves a military advantage, though. Once again, we return to Bruges in Flanders, where in 1127 there was a siege. It was at that time that Charles the Good had been assassinated and the perpetrators had taken refuge at the castle. By sending a message tied to an arrow, the besiegers promised that they would be lenient with the conspirators if they would return the Count's treasure, which was kept in the castle. It was a promise that they never meant to keep. It was justified because, quote, they were not obliged to respect any faith or any oath of the most impious serfs who had betrayed their legitimate and natural lord. In other words, by murdering their lord, they had stepped outside of the rules of the game and they could be treated with contempt. They felt that a promise made to an oathbreaker was void. When the conspirators eventually surrendered after the five week siege, they were quickly executed. In another episode of Oathbreaking, we can see just how seriously the offence was taken. Henry the Young King had made an alliance with Philip I of Flanders and King Louis VII of France against his father Henry II of England. In 1174, they attacked Rouen, the capital of Normandy, which was held by the English king. The fighting had gone on for 19 days when King Louis offered up a day of truce to celebrate the Feast of St. Lawrence. Saint days were sacrosanct to the medievals in a time when the Catholic Church ruled everything. The truce was agreed upon, but William Newberg, the English chronicler, reported that Louis, swayed by his nobles, was persuaded to break the truce and carry out a sneaky assault. The attackers quietly crept up to the city walls with ladders, but were noticed by a priest looking out from a church tower. He raised the alarm and the assault was prevented. Newberg claimed that the king poured the blame back onto the Count of Flanders, nevertheless, the stain of such a disgraceful transgression stuck more to the king's character. It would seem that many things were accepted as cunning and ingenious when it came to the art of medieval warfare, but to break an oath, even to the enemy, was just taking matters too far. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Medieval Madness, please do subscribe to the channel if you're enjoying these videos, and I'll see you next week for another one. Have a great week, cheers!